Welcome everyone. My name is Ben Buchanan and I am the, uh, the CEO of NovoPsych. And I just really wanna welcome everyone here tonight for this um, webinar on dissociation and dissociative experiences. And we're very lucky to have Dr. Marianne Kate um, to talk to us about the, um, the scale that she's developed and all of the expertise that she's been developing um, in her research on dissociation. Um, Dr. Marianne Cade is a psychology lecturer and researcher specializing in interpersonal trauma, attachment, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Marianne currently lectures on the Masters of Professional Psychology and Bachelor of Psychology Science program at Southern Cross University uh, she's developed units at university and is on the scientific committee of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. Marianne developed the multidimensional um, inventory for dissociation, the mid-60, which is very graciously put on NovoPsych so that all of us um, can administer it quickly and easily. The mid 60 is now recognized among some very clever people, including people at the Harvard Medical School and is recommended by the eye movement desensitization and re reprocessing trainers throughout Europe, North America and Australia. So Dr. Marianne Kate, welcome to, um, and thank you for um, doing this webinar tonight. It's just fantastic that so many people are interested. I'm always passionate to share knowledge about dissociation and it looks like I can definitely fill some gaps and give people some tools and skills. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen. And so what are we going to do today? We are going to learn a bit about dissociative experiences and symptoms, you know, work out who's at risk of having a dissociative disorder, we're going to look a bit at the DSM-5 TR dissociative disorders, but I don't want it to be dry. So this will be very case focused when we're looking at MID-60 cases. But for people that aren't familiar, I'll do a very brief introduction. Um, and then we're going to do five case studies of uh, real people with uh, quite high levels of dissociation and different presentations and look at some of the issues about uh, dissociation generally and what we need to think about when we're assessing dissociation in clients. So what is dissociation? The big question, it depends who you ask is one answer, but if we talk to the DSM-5TR, it will say that when a person experiences a disconnection from their memories, feelings, actions, thoughts, body or identity, and then dissociative disorders are more intense, so characterised by this disruption or discontinuity in the normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, their own body representation, motor control, and their behaviour. So it is extremely all-compassing. It's actually a strategy that enables people to continue and endure through traumatic and stressful events that would otherwise overwhelm their capacity to cope. The fragmentation of the intense sensor sensorium of experiences that dissociation brings can give people relief from these otherwise difficult situations and experiences. Marlene Steinberg, who developed the structured clinical interview for dissociation called the SCID-D, uh, she has been really influential in the way I think about dissociation. And she talks here about what the issues, the main um, ways that it presents. So the first one is amnesia or memory problems. And this is involving difficulty recalling personal information, but it's generally of a traumatic nature. So when we're looking at disorders that's more looking like dissociative amnesia if it was a standalone symptom depersonalization is when somebody is merely an alien to themselves there's a sense of disconnection to who they are um, and this sense of being the stranger the stranger in the mirror derealization is the world is feeling alien even things that should be familiar like people that are your loved ones, your own house, things you know well, 
the world is not as it should be and this very disconcerting sense about that so that's derealization identity confusion is the fourth part of it and that's a struggle about who am I what is my identity and feeling very unsure and there being really um, difficult difficult ways of trying to define the self and it can also be identity alteration where there's a sense of feeling like another person or people or acting like another person or people so somebody may experience one of these symptoms and that may meet diagnostic criteria or in its most intense form it would be dissociative identity disorder and the person would have all of these five symptoms this is again from Marlene Steinberg and so those five things are pushed into the middle there and it's like what can what is the ramifications and so often we see uh, like schizophrenic symptoms so voice hearing and hallucinations or fears of possession um, like panic disorder obsessive compulsive disorder suicidal ideation suicide attempts losing time sexual dysfunction which could be hypo or hyper um, sexuality um, or swinging between those two uh, mood swings eating disorders phobias self-harm flashbacks and post-traumatic symptoms, mania, anger, antisocial acts, depression, substance abuse, addictions. So often people look at what is around that and miss the central part of it, which is dissociation. And often there's very complex presentations. A person may have you know, substance use disorder and borderline personality disorder and um, complex PTSD and depression and anxiety and like that one of the joining factors that hasn't been looked at is the dissociation that joins it all together and keeps it in place. So we're up to the DSM-5 TR. Uh, dissociative disorders have been around in every version of the DSM. Um, they became quite heavily embedded into the third version and continue to do so. Uh, so as I was saying, we've got dissociative amnesia, uh, which used to be called psychogenic amnesia, depersonalization, derealization disorder, dissociative identity disorder. Other specified dissociative disorder is a very important diagnosis, but you wouldn't know it from the name. Uh, within this, we have a subclinical variant of dissociative identity disorder that I will talk about where the personality states, uh, the parts aren't as developed. Um, and there is also issues around political prisoners might fall under this as well. Um, people that have been in cults where there's been a lot of um, issues around sort of thought reform and programming. And unspecified dissociative disorder is an emergency room kind of diagnosis. So how do we know if it's dissociative identity disorder or the subclinical variant? The way that I talk about this to people is looking at, does the person remain in executive control? Is it switching or is it an intrusion? So I'll give the example. Imagine somebody is driving a car and they have dissociative identity disorder. If there is a switch in the personality state, the driver actually changes. There might be someone asleep in the back, someone might be watching what's going on, but there's this shifting around and the person that has control of the vehicle is different. In a subclinical other specified dissociative disorder, the person is in the driver's seat and they're experiencing intrusions. It may feel like there's a child crying in the back. It might be someone trying to grab at the steering wheel. It might just be this incredible chatter in their head. They may suddenly feel this angry outburst, wind down the window, have a bit of road rage, have no idea where it came from. Um, but they're still in the driver's street seat. They may not have as much control of their personality as they want because the intrusions, but they're aware of what is going on. So that is kind of the difference between um, DID and the subclinical variant. In the dissociation field, we talk about the concept of structural dissociation, which is a severe, a more severe kind of dissociation. And within that, 
there there are parts of the personality that are walled off from the others. So if somebody just has dissociative amnesia, the part that is walled off would be just related to one experience. But when you have people that have had lots and lots of trauma um, and have the presentation more of subclinical or DID, there's lots of amnestic barriers across a lot of experience and senses of who they are. It's um, a theory that I'd love to talk about, but I don't have time to get into the nitty gritty of it. But uh, it's on a hard near house and steel. You can look into it if you're interested. In a lot of you will be familiar with therapies that talk about parts. So, you know, it might be whether you're just talking about inner critic or transaction analysis. Internal family systems is really interesting because the actual way the systems are, in, uh, are defined with the managers, firefighters and exiles and what they do is actually quite like somebody with dissociative identity dis disorders own personality system. It actually has a very similar feel to it. But in um, internal family systems, it does not have to be sort of that elaborate that elaborated. Same with schema therapy has the same concepts or well, inner child work, which was talked about a lot and um, popularized by John Brad Bradshaw. So are they dissociative? Well, the, this boundary between what is a normal experience and what is dissociation is really contested and it depends who you ask. So the way that I see it is that these experiences of having parts are dissociative when there's a disconnection from overwhelming or stressful feelings and experience, even if these don't meet the diagnostic criteria. It's like we can say somebody is anxious. They don't need to have an anxiety disorder. They can be, you know, feeling quite down, but not necessarily depression. So I do see that these things can both be seen as dissociation. I'll give an example of, uh, and one thing I should say also is just a content warning. When we're talking about dissociation, there is trauma and there can be some really intense trauma histories. We will touch on that as we go through. So please, if you need to step away, do so, any breathing or grounding that you normally do, uh, please practice your self-care as we go through. Um, so imagine a teenager who's grown up, he's had his best friend, they're thinking about going off to university together in Sydney. It's, this guy, his friend's been having a bit of a hard time, studying hard for exams, and his friend's feeling really overwhelmed. And then he hears that his friend has taken his life and he's just about to go into his university exams and he can't cope with dealing with his friend's suicide. He knows I need to get through this. I have no choice. I need to get through my exams. So he doesn't feel anything. He completely disconnects his experience. Um, it's like this hasn't happened. Then afterwards, the exams are over. He gets together with his friends. He you know, has drink, rages, cries, deals with it, and it's no longer a dissociated part of that. But I would still see that as a dissociative process. And even in a dissociative client, we would, if a dissociative client had that experience, we'd be talking about that as dissociation. But um, some people would say, oh no, the, you know, there's no sort of amnesia for it. It's just a feeling. So therefore it's not dissociation. And in the theory of structural dissociation, it, it wouldn't be. Um, Colin Ross, who is one of the uh, world top world experts in dissociation, he sort of says, it, well, if you were described as structural dissociation, you have to ask, what is just a feeling and not a personality? But I like to see a broader term and to bridge those experiences together, because otherwise the concepts of dissociative identity disorder can seem really far removed. But actually, if we look at the steps of how those things, um, the gradients, it's not, it makes a lot more sense. 
So I see dissociation as a strategy that enables people to survive in the harshest environments. And this is particularly when they are growing and they're in family environments where there's really not much nutrients to grow. It's a really hostile and harsh environment. But this disconnection does enable people to grow. This is another thing from Colin Ross. He says, dissociation provides the illusion that everything is okay. So uh, it allows people to downregulate. Uh, otherwise, they might be constantly hypervigilant, particularly people that are in these situations where there's some inescapable trauma. Their body can't stay at that level at all times. And it is like by not recognising part of the experience, that full sensorium, sensorium of experience, then there can be some relief that there is something that is okay. Dissociative disorders are really common. So when people are saying they haven't seen them, I would say, yes, you have. It's just you didn't know you have. Um, and hopefully now you will see, uh, you'll be able to pick it up more. So when people do these general population studies and go knocking door to door, they find around the world that around about 10% of people will meet a dissociative disorder criteria in their lifetime. And in university students, it's slightly higher, around about 11%. Rates are similar in women and men. Strangely, we don't know where all the men are, about like nine women for every man in therapy. And then in gender conforming um, community, there seems to be quite high rates as well, but I don't have data on that. So the way I see it is dissociation can be considered. I think I've got a question. Hey, hey, coming. Marianne. Uh, hey, hey, I've, hey. Got, I've, I've got a lots of questions coming through the chat. Lots of um, enthusiasm there. I had a couple of questions just um, relevant for this slide on the cultural expression of um, dissociation and whether there's differences across cultures. Yeah, absolutely. And that needs to be considered, particularly in dissociative identity disorder with things like possession states, which may be culturally normal. So a person wouldn't get the diagnosis if it was the experiences were normal in their culture. Um, and there are, I'm sure, differences in the way like with all disorders, there would be some cultural differences in the way that things are expressed. But what I found when I looked internationally is that dissociative disorders were most common in countries that were unsafe compared to countries that were safe. So it was to do with the level of safety in a country is what predicted the level of dissociation. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. So um, I just think it's another thing that can be in the toolkit. People go depression, anxiety, dissociation. I think that it needs to be added. That might sound quite ambitious, um, but it's something to keep in mind that these things often do co-occur. And with 10% in their lifetime and the people that have dissociative disorders, they're not this unusual group. It's like this distinct group. They're people that have post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and anxiety and a raft of other issues and maybe have misdiagnosed as schizophrenia or bipolar um, the, the list goes on they generally spend seven years um, in the mental health system people with dissociative identity disorder before their um, dissociation is actually detected so um, it's missed a lot so another bold statement that I'm making but I'm going to make it if you're working with people with complex trauma the way that people learn to deal with complex trauma that is inescapable is to dissociate. So whether that's clinically, it's, it's a pathological level, but there should be a level of dissociation with all clients, I would think, that have experienced complex trauma. So what causes dissociation? Uh, one of the big predictors is attachment. So you can look at a 12-month-year-old and you can kind of guess if they're going to be uh, it's interesting if they're going to be dissociative as an adult, but perhaps you can guess they're going to grow up in an environment that will make it, you know, embed that dissociation. So if a child, so if we go back to the strange situation experiments, a child who had this disorganized attachment, they weren't, they were, it was just very difficult to classify because the movements were really strange and the 
child was very confused about moving towards, moving away. And it's explained as the fright without solution. Um, so when the caregiver's there, the child has these in incompatible behaviours. They want to go and get care and connection, um, a caregiver and be comforted because they're distressed. But the source of, source of their distress is actually their caregiver. So how do you resolve that? And um, dissociation could be a way of resolving that conflict between wanting to go towards and wanting to run away. It enables them to be with an abusive caregiver, or it's not always abusive, particularly at this age, it um, can be a frightening caregiver. Um, and that could be because the, the caregiver themselves is frightened or they may just be completely misattuned or um, doing something that, that the child finds uh, really confronting and frightening. So uh, highly dissociative individuals don't have a secure attachment style. So you'll notice that in therapy, there's very few people with a dissociative disorder. It's a very big predictor about whether or not they have a secure um, attachment. In my research, they had a fearful style so they wanted to be these close and loving relationships but were terrified of that and then people that were in clinical treatment they would be even more so so they would have they want to attach but they were absolutely had this complete profound mistrust that told them I should never trust anyone ever um, it was just too frightening for them to to trust another human but they still the bigger part of them wanted to attach. So it's this very, it's very sort of uh, mirroring these early years. I've also looked at parent-child dynamics as well. And this is a really big talk. So I'm just going to try to give a few little snapshots. Um, but you can ask a client if they're comfortable seeking comfort from another person when they're hurt, unwell or upset. And if they say they're not, that's an a 21-fold risk for a dissociative disorder. They feel they haven't had any control over their life growing up, a 17-fold risk. I mean, these are massive risks. Um, if they didn't feel safe when they're at home, a 10-fold risk. Um, and if they didn't feel their thoughts, feelings and beliefs mattered and that they weren't taken seriously, it's a 10-fold risk. Even if their parents didn't support them to develop the skills and knowledge to be independent and take charge of their own life, that was a seven-fold risk in females. It's a nine-fold risk. So these are really interesting things that aren't often talked about. It's mainly the focus is on trauma, um, but it's those parent-child dynamics that seem to really reinforce this. So it's the trauma going on with a background of these negative parent-child dynamics. This is from an um, article that I wrote uh, and again looks at some of the big risk factors. These are trauma related, but it's sexual abuse is a big predictor, experiences that are potentially life threatening to a child and to a child abandonment is life threatening as well. So threats of abandonment um, showed up really highly um, as well as deprivation of basic needs. Um, there was a really big risk factor and that was if the person was um, sexually abused and had been choked or smothered. And that's 106, which is, that's like double the risk of smoking causes lung cancer. So it's like a really intense risk factor. And it's also concerning for a new reason. And that's that with younger people, we're talking sort of people in their late um their late teens, early 20s, it's very common now just in their own sexual practices to be choking each other. And like the third of women, young women who um, had vaginal sex, they were choked the last time. So it's like it's like one third of these women. So people are experiencing these things and the body doesn't necessarily know there might be consent, although there's often not consent, but the body doesn't know that there's consent. And I sort of get worried that maybe this is, this could lead to dissociation as well in people that haven't had um, those levels of trauma. It's not just that trauma happens, it's what happens after the trauma and also the parent's role in it. So um, in my research, the mother's role or reaction, if it was negative compared to being positive, it was a 
fold risk of a dissociative disorder, not as strong for the father's role, which was which was interesting, but sort of being blamed for the abuse was, you know, these things are particularly problematic um, where it's the child is told that the abuse they experience is their fault. This is from some interviews I did with women with dissociative identity disorder in an in, inpatient unit. Um, and it's sort of very similar to the sort of questionnaire research that I've done as well. Uh, a lack of, so women with dissociative identity disorder report, report a lack of maternal care and concern. There's this behind closed doors, I kept hearing this from people, behind closed doors where the family presents to the outside world as upstanding, but they're masking these high levels of dysfunction and abuse. This gaslighting, where the child is told it's not real, you make it up. Um, some people don't even realise it's so normalised, they don't realise that it shouldn't be happening. It's just what happened in their family. A lot of people internalise the blame that the reason they're being abused is because they're bad, they're inherently bad. Um, some people, well, actually, people with DID tend to report really bizarre abuse. And I, I'm not saying that I don't think it's real because I do, but the abuse, they, they grapple with how could this be true because it seems so odd and how could have that have happened? It doesn't make any sense. So they really struggle to make um, sense of their experiences. Um, people turned to blind eye, no one intervened. Generally people knew at some point and people didn't do anything. And with people with dissociative identity disorder, the abuse starts early, um, before the age of six, often occurring on a daily basis. And from the questionnaires that I've done with people that weren't diagnosed but met diagnostic criteria and people that were, the average sexual abuse episodes was like 13 to 1400, which is you know just absolutely phenomenal and completely consistent, which was really interesting across those groups. So the abuse is often severe and life-threatening, includes multiple perpetrators, including family members, and that may be organised as well. So the mid-60s. So the mid-60s, the self-report screening tool for measuring dissociative symptoms and experiences. It's based on the parent instrument, which is a 218 item diagnostic instrument. Um, and I spoke to Paul Dell about creating this and looked at doing the most five predictive factors from each of the MIDs, uh, 12 subscales. And it's peer reviewed, has excellent internal reliability, content and convergent validity. So it's sort of gone through the processes. So this is, it's very, the, the scales are nearly identical to the mid. There's only one, which was a mixed associative symptoms bag that changed and um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, which can be common that they don't have to happen, but they can be common with people uh, with dissociation that became, it's only one item, but it was a standalone item. It didn't match anything else. So that's its own little item there. So the idea that people have awareness, they've got older personalities, they experience angry intrusions, like angry voices, persecutory voices. Is this an inner critic? Maybe if it's low, that's a bit more than that. Um, Amnesia, and again, amnesia is a really problematic word in dissociation because people confuse it with dissociative amnesia. In this, uh, it means time loss when a person is in a different personality state. So it's a lack of awareness um, in DID situations. People have distress about severe memory problems. They can't remember much of their past, depersonalization, derealization, trance, flashbacks. And there's this profound and chronic sense of self puzzlement People just don't understand themselves and that can drive them into therapy, even if they don't understand their dissociation. It's just, they just do not understand what is going on with them. Somatic symptoms like conversion disorder symptoms, like not being able to see as if they're blind, um, not being able to hear if they're deaf, um, not being able to walk, feeling paralyzed, these, these kind of symptoms and the seizures. Uh, why not use the DES? Um, the DES is excellent at picking up dissociative identity disorder, and that's what it was intended to do. It is not a general dissociation screening tool, and if you use it as such, then you will not pick up dissociative amnesia. Um, 
it misses 96% of cases of dissociative amnesia if you use a cutoff of 30. So basically, it's absolutely of no value. And it was not meant to be a value. It wasn't meant to assess dissociative amnesia. It also misses a lot of derealization too. So, um, yeah, it's it depends. If you think somebody has dissociative identity disorder and you want to do a quick, quick screener, I'd totally recommend it. But if you're looking at general dissociative symptoms, I wouldn't. I wouldn't suggest it. So this is how prevalent dissociative disorders are. And DID is one we focus on the most. It is actually the rarest. Depersonalization and derealization disorder are, as a disorder, rare, standalone, a bit well, not rare, but not that common. But they're very common symptoms. It's just that people may have other symptoms that give them a different uh, dissociative disorder. Uh, so other speci specified dissociative disorder is 3.2%, um, which is a lot more as makes sense. The abuse isn't as extreme and as if it's not as extreme, that kind of abuse isn't as common as with dissociative identity disorder. Um, and dissociative amnesia, I think it's actually more common than that. But the problem when they're doing these surveys is they often use the DES to screen first and then it misses dissociative amnesia. So I'm guessing it's probably more around 5%. So um, when we're looking at the mid, we also look at conversion disorder, which on its own is rare, but it's often a symptom that we see in dissociation um, and the PTSD dissociative subtype, although PTSD is quite common, the dissociative subtype is sort of estimated around 2%. It might be higher. Yeah. So. so this is the focus of the DES, as I was saying, kind of missing that middle range of dissociation. So picking up the normal or like the, the elevated and depersonalization, often people don't score high enough to have pathological dissociation. So even if they really have a lot of depersonalization, they still might not, even though it's measuring it, they still might not might, might not get a score that's high enough. And this is the mid, mid-60, much more uh, broader. It captures, it's got questions that capture all of these things. The MID-60, I'm not saying it's the be-all and end-all, um, like the... The full version has validity scales built into it. It's a really clever instrument. Um, so why wouldn't you use it? The issue is often that it's, clients just find it really lengthy. And for dissociative clients, it can be really hard to answer 218 questions. They might find that just a bit too beyond them. And you might also use it where you're not particularly worried about dissociation, but you're just sort of doing more of a screener to see if it's there. It would make sense. But the best way, as always, is through um, structured clinical interviews. And Marlene Steinberg, I was talking about earlier, her um, SCID-D is, um, you know, considered to be the gold standard. But Colin Ross's dissociative disorders interview schedule is also excellent. And that's available. The second one is available open source. We will be doing an adolescent MID 60. It's ready, and um, Ben and David will get it up on Nova Psych uh, soon. Uh, it's very similar to the, um, the MID. There's only two questions that needed wording changes. This is based on the, again, the parent, the, the big version, which has an adolescent version as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that. I know a lot of people have been asking for more tools for assessing dissociation in adolescents. So. Okay, we're about to move into the case studies. How's everyone going? I hope you're going okay. I think everyone's going really well. There's lots of questions coming up, very enthusiastic. One question that's come up a bunch of times, um, a bunch of people have asked, um, about the relationship between dissociation and neurodiversity. So, you know, the I suppose the incidence of dissociation among people with autism. Um, mm. Are you I aware of any about, that? Look, um, it's a 
it's a big issue around it at the moment um, and it's really confusing about what's actually going on and I will get into that so I might just hang yeah. off on the autism question but I you know obviously it's such an it can be so overwhelming for people with autism um, their experiences that dissociation could be part of that response I mean that totally makes sense and there's also this huge crossover like so many people with autism experience complex trauma themselves and so unpicking you know what's complex trauma and um you know what's dissociation what's the autism and where they all play in together um but we will look at this um the concept of multiplicity or plurals which uh a lot of people particularly young people in the autism community identify with so I will talk a little bit about that because it does present differently um, and it wasn't what I was looking at in my research and this field is relatively new that's looking at that probably you know it's only a presentation that people have been thinking about in the last couple of years yeah okay so this is Deanna um, these case studies are real people the identifying details have been changed. These are people that are involved were involved in my research. Um, so, you know, perhaps different details than you might have, obviously, uh, in the clinic. So Deanna is 46. She had a super complex life, the most complicated life I think I've ever heard about. She worked in health and social care. She worked in like in a professional role. She worked in other roles, like they were quite highly skilled, but in different personalities and they did not cross over. And, she, you know, she would have been absolutely incredible if she had the knowledge that she had in all her different roles in her life, because it was just phenomenal what she was able to learn and understand and she was a mother to four children um, so there are extensive parts of Deanna's childhood she doesn't remember she could barely conjure any memories or images of her parents she grew up with them but it was just like this completely wiped out of her memory she left home early um, her boyfriend wanted to get her pregnant and sort of sort of tricked her into this and then she ended up in this awful domestically violent um, relationship that she couldn't get out of because she was so amnestic for the abusive episode so when the police would get involved it was really confusing and they couldn't work out what was going on and neither could she and yeah it was this really tricky situation so at the time she did the mid-60s she was an inpatient at a private psychiatric hospital she was not a fan at all of being diagnosed um this is what she'd said I've been trying to run away from it for 10 years yeah I don't want the diagnosis I want treatment but not with the diagnosis but then it's hard when you've switched and you're acting out of character and as I said her life did seem incredibly incredibly difficult um she was quite remarkable what she was able to achieve with her level of um multiplicity so if we have a look, I'm going to go through the um, Nova Psych, what it looks like once you've put in all the data and answered all the questions. So we're really looking at the mean score. So it's 64, which is really high. Uh, it says the client displays severe dissociative and post-traumatic symptoms. High scores may also reflect neuroticism, attention-seeking, exaggeration, lingering, or psychosis. So check the scales. Um, it's also 64 is a cutoff. So if it was even 63 we wouldn't see that we would see probably has DID or a severe dissociative disorder and PTSD and it wouldn't look quite as alarming as it sounds there her scores and when we look at the NIT the the easiest way to understand it is like a score of 77.5 is like 77.5 percent of the time I'm experiencing am you know am into alter amnesia um you know 80% of the time I have awareness of alter personality. So that's a way of looking at how intense these scores actually are and what they mean. And loss of autobiographical memory 100% of the time. You might say that's an exaggeration, but honestly, she it, she really had such, I've never seen such extensive amnesia in a person. Um, and that was in that particular personality state. Obviously, different personality states would no more um, and when you're working with somebody with that level of fragmentation yet yeah, different parts hold different information 
So she didn't have so much PTSD, 28. It's still you know, clinically relevant. Um, it's in the clinical range. It's not super high. And she did have some body symptoms. 10% is just the cutoff and heaps of self-confusion, which we can imagine. It would be hard to have her life and not have self-confusion. So being self-confused 90% of the time makes a lot of sense to me. So her scores are... I mean, this isn't quite accurate, but I've just done a little black line, which would be the, the overall cutoff. But you can see that she's, you know, just highly dissociative across the board. So diagnostic impressions. Um, so she's probably the most dissociative individual I've met. She And it's interesting, I just picked random cases and this is what came up. So I was quite, I was like, oh, that's right. I remember this interview was unforgettable um so she'd resisted this diagnosis for years she'd done her best to get on with her life and she knows she needs treatment to function better so for me from sort of spending an hour and a half with her talking about her life I would have completely said that her DID was real I don't think there's any way it could have been malingered um I didn't think that there was anything else going on. So I would have supported that, but you can't see that. That's just because I know that information. So if you saw this, then you would still have to go, um, what else could be happening? Um, ruling out factitious disorder, malingering, social cultural presentations, which I will talk about when we talk about faking bad on questionnaires. So the really important thing to do is ask questions, you know, like, oh, can you give me an example of a time when um, and going back to the questionnaire and using that to sort of find out more information and also looking at patterns of answering. Is it just the same extreme answer all the way through? And there is variation through her answers, even though they are over the, they are pretty high overall. So this is the diagnostic criteria for dissociative identity disorder in the DSM-5-TR. And I would have said she definitely had two or more distinct personality states. Um, she had recurrent gaps in the recall of all of these things, so everyday events, personal information, traumatic events, and they were causing clinical distress. Um, and there was no accepted religious practice. So she was clearly a person with DID but again I know that because uh, of my experience so how might DID present in a therapeutic setting so people often think that it's going to be this like really flamboyant presentation you know for United States of Tara or something like that and that's unlikely um, although how overt or covert it depends on what's going on for the person um, on the current levels of stress uh, for some people, it's really subtle. It's really, really subtle. And only a minority present with these like really distinct individual personality states. And there, some people will have clear, you know, other names, wardrobes, hairstyles, handwriting, accents. And it is fascinating. I mean, some people can be anaphylactic in one personality state and not in sure. another or blind in one personality state and not in the other. And, you know, they've done such interesting research and it, it's, these things are real. Like the person can't see or, you know, is having this reaction. Um, it's, it's quite a phenomenal thing to to witness um, and to see people switch into another personality state and often it can be someone that's really quite cautious and protecting them like a protector part might come out and just make sure everything's okay and then it's okay continue with the interview so we we're talking about uh, ASD and this sort of fits into a picture so since about 2018 but much more since the pandemic there's been a increase in people identifying as plurals and plurals is this umbrella term so anyone with an experience of multiplicity can self-identify with and there's this complex interplay between lots of things and um, one of them is dissociative identity disorder so the person may have dissociative 
identity disorder, traumagenic as we more traditionally know it. Um, a lot of them are maladaptive daydreamers and some are into this practice of reality shifting. There's a lot of people in these like online worlds, but there's also this like hypnotic states that people try to get into to enter different realities. A lot of the people in this space are, are, are autistic as well. Um, probably more young women, I think. Um, often histories of complex trauma, often gender non-conforming. It's often general levels of dissociation, high levels of fantasy, absorption and hypnotizability. So all of these things, it's really hard to um, unpick what's actually happening in, in this space. And we need a lot more research on it. Um, this is from a woman who herself has DID, um, Emily Christensen. And so she's done a lot of work on understanding what is the plural community about. And she sort of explains here, they often have elaborate inner worlds with relationships rich in detail where all parts of the system seem to have knowledge and access as well as awareness of where they have access and why they're likely to have a high number of fictive alters which is um, like fictional characters uh, and include extensive and detailed backstories from movies or video games um, often the development of the inner world and relationships between parts is something that the plurals enjoy and find soothing and that sounds more like it might be more autistic to me, um, which is distinguished from those with dissociative disorders who are generally phobic of their internal world and interactions with other parts. And that's where you see there's these huge amnestic barriers. There's lots of difficulties in traumagenic or traditional DID. There's so many barriers between communicating with parts. And it's very different. Like in um, the plural systems, people might get married and get a pet or like, like internal parts might do these things, which would just, it's, you could not... Um, see those things happening in uh, a, a traditional traumagenic system so it doesn't fit the criteria of DID or, or if you're using the um, European system partial DID uh, or OSDD so the subclinical variant but it corresponds with maladaptive daydreaming as a practice but these people do feel that they have DID and will be quite clear in stating that and may also wish to have a diagnosis where people that have dissociative like traumagenic um, traditional DID generally don't have any clue about what's going on for themselves and often resist diagnosis for a long time and struggle with the concept of them having alters because of what it means um, so it's quite different was there any questions about that one before I go on? Just because uh, I know there was a question about autism. They're good? Okay. All right. Okay, I'm just looking at the time. Just going to get through. Um, okay, so this is Patricia. She grew up in a situation of domestic violence, physical abuse from numerous people, including her dad. Uh, no one intervened to protect her. Um, she, her mother was emotionally abusive and she was sexually abused by her father from when she was young. Um, she was also abused by a family friend who exploited her for financial gain. So she had multiple perpetrators. It's a similar presentation to many women with DID. Uh, and... Just trying to think, no, she was, uh, Patricia was an impatient as well. So she's got a high score. It's um, 52, which would be indicative of dissociative identity disorder. Uh, however, she doesn't really have much amnesia for recent events, which would be, to me, without that, she doesn't really have it. Um, she's got high levels of dissociative amnesia, depersonalization. She's really aware she has altered personalities but do they take executive control? So the issue is, is the driver changing in the car? Uh, doesn't have huge, like PTSD is high, it's not outrageous, and she's got a high level of self-confusion. 
so you can see that the alter personalities and the loss of memory being the two key symptoms for her. Now, when you scroll down into your scoring and interpretation information in the Nova Psych, um, so when you get your results in Nova Psych, you'll see that it has the items, the relevant items, and amnesia for recent events, it lists the items there. So that's the DID subscale. So if we dive deeper into it, you can then check, well, what were the answers to those questions? And so you have you changed your appearance? She's answered one. Um, and she's also answered one out of 10 to finding yourself somewhere and with no memory of how you got there. So uh, you could look more about well, what does this mean? Because for some people that might be, you know, it might be quite insignificant when they tell you about it, but she might tell you something about, oh, well, that happens, you know, maybe every every second week. And then suddenly it doesn't feel like a one anymore and she explains what's happening and it feels more intense. Or you may listen to the description and it may sound again like intrusions rather than her um, changing, changing the seat in the car. So diagnostic impressions, it, the mean score indicates DID, profile suggests subclinical variant. Um, again, asking her to indicate um, the, so you know does she have these personalities that are responsible for daily life other than herself or is she just experiencing intrusions but on the information available I'd say other specified dissociative disorder there's a really difficult part in other specified dissociative disorder it's such a shame because subclinical uh, DID really has no clear home in the DSM-5 TR, it's called partial um, dissociative identity disorder in ICD-11. But when we look at it here, it says pretty much um, it, in individuals who report no, no dissociative amnesia. And that's just completely wrong. The wording is really wrong. It's the poor use of the term amnesia. In the ICD-11, this is stated as individuals often do not experience amnesia during episodes of dissociative intrusions. So it's not that you can't have amnesia about trauma in the past. It's about dissociative intrusions. But the way this is written is really quite clunky. You could still fit the diagnosis if that sounded right within this, but it's, um, I think it's just a little bit problematic. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, and within this, while we're looking at other specified dissociative disorder, you can see there, there's also um, the one that I was talking about earlier. So for people that may have been in cults or political prisoners, that might be um, the second one there. So just to know where it is. So we're going to go to Amelia. And she's a university student. Um, she's got a warm relationship with her mum, difficult relationship with her dad, who's was volatile, nice and nasty. Um, although hinted at that, she doesn't, we don't know really about a trauma history. She just mentions being slapped and kicked, doesn't talk about who did that. She has had no head injuries, but we know she had multiple febrile seizures as a child. So this is Amelia. So her score doesn't seem too high in a clinical perspective we're not looking at it being high particularly high there it's like she may have dissociative disorder or PTSD okay well let's look at it she's got no DID type symptoms um, no awareness of alter personalities but she does experience some angry intrusions that are clinically uh, significant and persecutory intrusions as well uh, pretty low to personalization, dissociative amnesia is very high. So, you know, sort of 58% of the time and, and the loss of autobiographical memory is, um, she feels that that's 74% of the time. It's really high. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, she, the fact that she has flashbacks indicates that there would be some um, trauma and, and that is in the clinical range there. Um, body symptoms, so she does have a few of those, but not enough in a clinical range. And she is experiencing quite a, a quite a high level of self-confusion. 
So again, if we sort of just have a quick look, we can see the real issues there is um, around memory that she just doesn't have the memory. And that's not a surprise in that she has the self-confusion, which we'd expect. So what do we think about Amelia? The extensive memory problems probably suggest dissociative amnesia, but we need to rule out medical causes. Um, experiences of persecutory and angry intrusions might be ego states but she doesn't have any sense of um, self state so it doesn't seem like these are dissociative parts um, and dissociative amnesia is generally accompanied by other post-traumatic symptoms and she does have flashbacks and self-confusion which does suggest some trauma history so I think on the basis of it, dissociative amnesia does look quite likely, but you, again, you'd need to um, talk to her a little more about those things. So that's our diagnostic uh, criteria for dissociative amnesia. And she clearly has the inability to recall important autobiographical information and um, the self-confusion would suggest that there's distress. So. Uh, but we do need to sort of rule out other other factors before that could be made with confidence. Also, just while we've got dissociative amnesia, I'm sorry, up on the screen, I will also just say that dissociative fugue used to be a disorder in its own right, but it's now sits under um, dissociative amnesia. So that's apparent purposeful. Uh, travel or bewildered wandering. It's been quite a few movies about it. It's actually incredibly rare and it's normally actually a dissociative identity disorder that hasn't yet been diagnosed, but it's sitting here under dissociative amnesia. If it ever needs to be found. All right, we're going to move to Dane. So he's a 19 year old student, grew up in a fairly stable family. His brother was pretty difficult when he was growing up. Um, his parents didn't really stop that. States he's never been physically abused, really rare for a male to, to state that. Most of them say that they have experienced some physical abuse somewhere along the line. Uh, don't know about adult stresses and trauma. Drug use is not known, but we know that he has had at least five blackouts. So I think he's said no to head injuries, but can't quite recall. All right, so here he goes. He's got a mean score of 33 and saying he may have a dis dissociative disorder. And this is how it would come up. This wording um, on the first page is actually how it comes up uh, according to the, the full version of the mid. So when you get the full version of the mid with that range, uh, it would sort of look at that range and say um, what that range is in. So that's why it's great having the extra information. So by dividing it, as I've done with the subscales, and putting it under the diagnoses. So it doesn't appear like this in um, the, the full mid. It doesn't have like dissociative amnesia and depersonalization in that in that same way. Um, they're not as sort of present. So he's got a lot of angry intrusions, 58% of the time he's feeling that way, but he doesn't, it's really low for an awareness of altered states. He's got a lot of depersonalization and derealization, as well as a lot of dissociative amnesia. So what's going on with Dane? He's really confused about what's going on as well. So PTSD is not really there. Conversion disorder is not a problem. It's self-confusion, distress, angry intrusions. So what's diagnostic impressions of Dane? Um, so uh, the depersonalization, amnesia and high levels of self-confusion do suggest that he has a dissociative disorder. Uh, I would really want to know from Dane, when did the amnesia, have you always had problems recalling, you know, things from childhood, have, you know, your issues with recent events, remembering them, is that, uh, is that something that's new? Looking at, you know, drug use could be part of this or a head injury. Um, so we really want to rule those out. Uh, angry intrusions can be high in younger people, but not as high as Dane. So, you know, you could potentially go, well, maybe there's a differential diagnosis here, you know, disruptive impulse control conduct. But um, on the whole, it does look like that there's... Um, it could be depersonalization or amnesia. 
Uh, so you could ask more also, uh, I think I've just focused a little bit here on depersonalization because often dissociative identity disorder gets all the attention. So um, just the idea and lots of people experience depersonalization across all of the dissociative disorders too. But people feeling I am no one, I have no self, um, feeling no emotions, um, feeling that their head is full of cotton wool, that they're really disconnected from their bodily experiences. And they have this difficulty owning their own memories. And does that, you know, I'd go, is that playing into it? Is that part of the picture that because he feels he's so depersonalized is he feeling like those memories aren't even his so you know it'd be worth exploring that with him about how the interplay between depersonalization and his sense of um, autobiographical memory so people with depersonalization can worry do i exist this is really existential crisis they feel they're going crazy it's like and you know you can see potentially this in his high level of self-confusion um you know oh my god is my brain ever going to be the same again it's, and senses of time speeding up slowing down and like emotional stimuli this um hypo reactivity and, and some vague somatic symptoms so derealization, we've sort of talked a bit about that. That's definitely one option, but we also have to keep uh, dissociative amnesia on the table, I would suggest. Get through. Okay, I'll quickly do Alpine here. Um, so she's 35. Her parents were pretty uncaring. She had little freedom. There was a high level of control. She felt pretty unsafe at home. Her dad was really unpredictable. He was the dad was really physically abusive on a daily basis up until when she was 15. Um, she ended up with broken bones. She was terrified, she was afraid for her life. And through all of this, when she was nine, her brother started sexually abusing her and um, he used threats and force. And she felt these high levels of shame and being scared and confusion. And this sort of still persists for, for Alpine. So her mean score isn't as high as you might expect at 29, which suggests she may have a dissociative disorder or PTSD if we're just looking at it alone. Um, but, you know, she's got no amnesia for recent events, no awareness of alter personalities. Really, I mean, she could serve to be very angry, but there's not angry intrusions coming out there. She's got pretty high levels of depersonalization and derealization. And um, dissociative amnesia is high, but not clinical. So her flashback score is really like 98 is nearly 100% of the time. So, I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but given what she's been through, it might not be, it might just feel that it's all the time for her. Like it might not be a deliberate, you know, trying to malinger. It might just feel like they're just happening and I can't cope. So she's got a high level of um, self-confusion and she's, I think, got the highest score on trance as well, being in sort of that disconnected state. So we can see those um, PTSD systems as symptoms being really high. That's what really stands out. So the diagnostic impression would be she has high levels of depersonalization. Um, dissociative amnesia is just below the threshold, so 20 versus 21. Um, PTSD symptoms are extreme. So the likely diagnosis would be the PTSD dissociative subtype. Um, comorbid dissociative amnesia is possible. So I would be asking her quite a bit more about her um, memory and, you know, what parts of her memory she can and um, can't access and sort of finding out why she's answered in the way that she has. So that's the PTSD criteria. And then it would be... Yeah, with depersonalization or derealization, it sounds like she had experienced both. Now we get into some of the tricky parts. Associative clients may struggle to answer accurately. I'm talking, I'm going to share a story here. A colleague of mine, um, she was verbally administering the MID to a client uh, who had problems with her vision, so couldn't complete it herself. 
And her client responded to an item about voice hearing. And she stated clearly, I don't hear voices. And partway through another question, she stopped and appeared to be listening and said, I think it's a three, but Susie thinks it's an eight. When Rachel was asked how she knew what Susie thought, she replied, well, she told me. I heard her. And this isn't uncommon. It can be really confusing and it's not deliberately trying to deceive um, at all. Uh, it's just people that have dissociative sim uh, symptoms and uh, systems, it's um, very difficult to how do you accurately reflect what's going on and the experience of what's going on? It's um, it's a very difficult thing. Dissociative clients also might think their experiences are common. So they might not realise that other people don't have dissociative symptoms. Um, you know, often they believe everyone has voices in their head uh, that, sorry, that people remember don't remember their childhood either they have problems with their memory and we reinforce this because people run around saying all sorts of things oh you know oh and a voice in my head said just do it and oh I'm so forgetful or there's hundreds of ways and if you just even uh, the next couple of days listen to the way that people talk you can understand how someone that has chronic dissociation might be led to believe that other people also have these experiences and because of that, that can also lead to an underreporting of symptoms because they're like, well, you know, I just have it, but just like everyone else. So faking good. Um, trying to be better than you are, like you don't want a diagnosis. This is really common with people that are afraid of having a schizophrenia di uh, diagnosis. And voice hearing is as common in dissociation as it, as it is in schizophrenia. So, you know, the, you've got this commonality. And so the fear is I'm going to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. And people may believe they don't have schizophrenia, but they know that something is very wrong and they're probably not being diagnosed with dissociation. So, um, it's common that they worry that if they tell somebody that they hear voices, that they're going to be locked up and th th they'll just be written off as crazy. So this is Kylie, um, one of the women that I interviewed, talking about this very thing. I wasn't going to tell them I had voices. The psychiatrist asked me if I'd filled out the dissociative experiences scale before and I said I had. She asked me if I was truthful. I said no. When she asked me why, I said, I don't want to have schizophrenia. She said, it's not about schizophrenia. Can you please fill it out and be honest? I did. And she came back to my bed and looked completely shocked and said, that's pathological. Then she tried to explain what dissociative identity disorder was. And she asked how many people I have here. I was still confused. I didn't know what she was talking about. So not only didn't she want schizophrenia, she still has such a level of amnesia that she doesn't realise that she actually has dissociative identity disorder herself. So faking bad and going back to um, the presentations we we're talking about before, is it faking bad? I don't know. How do we work this out? Um, so an individual may be so desperate for the diagnosis that they exaggerate their symptoms significantly. Um, this has been a, an ongoing theme that I'm hearing about with people that are treating dissociative disorders. Um, particularly in the last few years, uh, with people identifying as plural, often with fictive alters like Captain America. So we've got Captain America there. Uh, and they're also generally maybe self-diagnosed um, and be very clear about what diagnosis they have beforehand. So exaggerating symptoms to receive therapeutic attention and diagnostic label might be considered factitious disorder, but it's not that straightforward as the person may also genuinely believe or their perception is that their symptoms and experiences are, you know, they may be slightly different, but this is the disorder that they constitute. So clients may feel angry, upset, dismissed and invalidated if they don't get a diagnosis. And again, this is increasingly happening with people that um, identify as being plural um, and may also be autistic, uh, gender non-conforming, uh, and they see that this is the presentation 
and it's it's really difficult because we don't really know there's it, there's very poor knowledge we need to really unpick that really complicated um all those factors that come together to understand what's going on and it will be very different for some people it will be very much like DID and for other people it's not at all like DID uh, and it's, there's this huge spectrum across about um, what that could be so we need a lot more understanding so when you're monitoring, you can use the MID60 to monitor as well. Don't have high hopes that symptoms are just going to improve as you start treating a dissociative client. Client. So we do know that, yes, trauma-informed psychotherapy reduces dissociative symptoms. There's really great evidence on that. And it also improves mental health in a range of other ways. But dissociative symptoms may get worse before they get better. And that can fluctuate a lot depending on current stresses. So this is kind of like starting therapy with a DID client. So only one aspect may be visible to the client or the clinician. And you may just think, they just may think that there's a few rooms in the front of the house. You might ask them, well, I don't know if anyone lives around the back. And maybe someone's up in the attic because I hear this child cry. And, and over time, it becomes clear that this is part of their structure, their own structure, but the dissociative barriers are so intense that they don't have any idea of it. So going into it, the idea is I'm not as dissociative as I am. I can't see past, you know, I can't see past my history that's overgrown everything. Um, and with time, it does become clearer and the rooms become clearer and the links and the idea of being able to map what it is that is actually there that is so hidden. Uh, and people with dissociative disorders, and this could be all sorts of, like this could be dissociative amnesia or it could be uh, subclinical DID, but they lack awareness about what's buried. They might think they're working on one particular thing, like, oh, you know, there's this memory about this and they're just like busy working on this one memory, you know, got their little broom out, just working on that. And then by the time therapy is finished a long time later, it's really clear that the dissociative structures and what was there was, you know, really extensive um, but they had no idea of that so when you're talking about when you're answering questions on the MID60 they may be really underreported for this very fact people just don't know what's there you don't know what you don't know and dissociative structures that's the whole purpose is to keep you from knowing about the traumas you've experienced so you can remain attached to caregivers it's um, the structural dissociation story so increasing scores over time may be due to increasing self-knowledge, the client becoming aware that they're more dissociative than they realised. It also can be from processing traumatic content. This can be distressing and potentially lead to increases in all subscales in the MID60. For example, a person with dissociative amnesia may realize, uh, experience flashbacks, conversion symptoms, trance and self-confusion they may even realize they have more extensive memory gaps. So as they start to remember things, the symptoms get worse across the board and not just the amnesia. And a person with DID or subclinical DID may have more intrusions and start switching more to avoid, avoid the painful memories and painful realities, of their traumatic lives that are starting to emerge or become clearer to them as they're you know, in their house and saying, oh my God, this, this is in this room. I don't I ever want to look in this room of myself because it's, it's so hideous and it's terrifying. Um, and so it can lead to sort of a bit of a destabilization. And so that is why slow is fast in treating dissociation. Uh, it's understandable that a client may report being more dissociative, particularly in the early stages of therapy, but it can also serve as a warning that therapy is moving too fast and the client should be focusing as we do in triphasic trauma treatment with safety and stabilisation as the first. You have to get the person prepared so that they're able to do little bits of work on um, trauma processing and then move back to safety. And so it's not overwhelming for them. 
So this is where I get to my little thank yous. And I think Nova's like, thank you for having me. It's just been such an incredible opportunity to talk to everyone. Thanks Southern Cross University for supporting me uh, to, um, to prepare this presentation and give me the time to do that. The International Society of Trauma and Dissociation for just being fantastic and sharing such knowledge. My research participants without which I couldn't give you any of this and it was often really hard for them to talk to me and answer those really difficult questions and to all of you for you know wanting to extend your skills and knowledge in the field of trauma and dissociation and I'm just going to put some resources in the slides so in treatment guidelines if any of you are interested there's also a great list for people that are new to dissociation you're going oh my god I've got my first DID case and I don't know what to do and you're finding it really hard to get support this is a wonderful group. So there's the details there. And this is also um, just details for me as um, association researcher, if you want to keep connected. This is my little ode to Marlene Steinberg, who wrote Stranger in the Mirror, the first book I ever read on dissociation that got me completely interested in it. Okay, so that is my really, really, really fast trip through dissociation and the dissociative disorders. and. We've got seven minutes. Well, Dr. Marianne, Kate, thank you so much for that very comprehensive um, overview of dissociation and the mid-60. There are um, 99 plus messages in the chat box saying thank you as well. The chat box has been going really crazy and there's lots of good questions there. Um, and I've selected a few but I wonder if you could answer. There were over 643 people oh, um, wow. here at the webinar. So lots of interest. And it's so and nice to see all these lovely comments. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate that. So can I ask you some of these questions that came up? Um, Kelly asked, if, you've, if you see someone who's got high scores on the mid across the board, would you see the multiple personalities from session to session or even within a session? Um, it would very much just depend on the person, but often there's more one person that will be presenting at therapy at a time, but there can be switches depending on the content um, and subtle changes. And But those things take time. Um, like it would be when the person is comfortable and feels a sense more of can be more when they're more safe as well particularly dealing with child parts I mean so you won't necessarily see it um no yeah and a lot of people you know they might have been treating someone for seven years and haven't noticed like yeah. it, it happens and and I think that's why people think oh no I would have noticed and often it can be really subtle and as mm. I said like you know when somebody steps in if you're going into tricky content and you know there's a personality that wants to come through and protect that person or is you just might see this it, it takes a while to read that and I, there'll be other people that are much better at it than me that it would be more mm. attuned but um and I, I mean, for, for me in my practice, I've certainly, you know, thought back on clients and thought, oh, they were dissociating or, or and not realize, and, you know, um, when I was actually treating them, they just had no idea. Yeah. Um, but it takes, a, it, you know, a, um, really inquiring into it and having a very keen eye. Um, someone's asked, um, is DID the new new term for multiple personality disorder yeah yeah yep. um uh sally has asked and if we suspect a child has dissociative experiences how do we measure that this um frank putnam has a child dissociative checklist which is a really good checklist that can be used yeah someone else was asking about the ages for the mid 60 which I believe is 18 plus. Mid-60 is 18 plus, and then we're doing uh, 16 to 19 for the adolescent MID. When that yes, comes so, the, so for all the Novo Psych users here, we'll, so we've got the mid-60 currently on there, so it will be in your library. And the, the adolescent version, uh, we will get up there in the next week or so as well, so you can use it with, did you say 16 plus? Yeah. 
yeah the the mid is actually used with people younger but I'm not just not that confident in offering that yet until I see how it goes so yeah even though it's the same the same questions um, and so here's another question from Lucy are there any recommendations for appropriate administration of the mid 60 for instance, is it appropriate to administer it to a new client in the first session without first understanding the presenting problems and assessing their mental state? Should it be administered within a clinical sesh, um, setting or can it be emailed to them to be completed at home? What's your um, yeah, I mean, I guess with all things, it's building rapport. People may not want to answer correctly. It's, it'll be quite confronting, a lot of the questions and feeling judged as a client. So until that therapeutic relationship has been built, I think it would be a little bit tricky just to, but I mean, often some places just do a whole battery of tests and then it would probably feel a little bit normal. But if you're being singled out with the mid 60, I think you'd be like, ah. yes, you can do it at home. I always recommend that the person is with somebody that they find supportive um, when it's done, just in case it does bring something up for them as they're completing it, that they have that support. Yeah, I, I like what you said about rapport um, because they've got to trust. Um, they won't trust the tool. They won't tr trust the mid-60 unless they tr trust the person giving it to them. And so yeah. I think that there, there um, always needs to be a therapeutic relationship um, to get the most out of, of these scales. Yeah, and particularly where people feel that may be unusual. You know? So um, they're like, oh, again, that schizophrenia fear. I think that that's... Um, pretty mm. pervasive where and people can under report for items they feel it's just not socially acceptable and the people with dissociation can often feel that they're just not acceptable to society whatsoever um and so you know showing themselves revealing themselves is so so vulnerable like such a vulnerable and difficult thing to do and and there were a few questions on that as well so how would you explain to a client the difference between um, dissociation uh, and um, schizophrenia like what's a accessible way to explain that uh, I, I think we need a whole webinar to really <laughs> look at the because the, the overlap is actually extraordinary and there is actually a huge amount of misdiagnosis of people that actually have dissociative identity disorder or and are diagnosed as schizophrenic and it's a huge traumatic um, like risk factor as well so um, for schizophrenia you know, where people that have had um, really high levels of abuse, I think are up to 50 times more likely to have schizophrenia. So, mm. you know, it's often seen as a medical issue, but then it's like, why in Finland, when they use open dialogue method, which is, you know, very nurturing and caring and listening to the voices and what they have to say, and these things seem to resolve, um, which sounds a bit like trauma processing to me. Um, yeah, so... so... So it's the case that people people will likely be diagnosed with schizophrenia or, rather than or, dissociation yeah rather than a dissociation there's still a lot of psychiatrists that will go i don't believe in it i don't believe in did like it's yeah. um particularly people that are older and grew up well, grew up or were training at the time went through sort of the memory wars and things like that but i mean there's actually excellent neurobiological evidence coming out of um, university college london and harvard medical school that looks at the like brain imaging of people with dissociative identity disorder and it has the best biological markers of any disorder so i mean there's fantastic evidence that it's very very real but it still has a real stigma about it um, where people are dubious because they find it so out there lots of questions coming through but i'm not, not sure i can sort sort them lots of people saying thank you uh yeah lots of people thinking that you're just amazing um Marianne, so um i couldn't agree more and and i and i i suppose the the um overarching thing that i thinking is that when we're in clinical practice and we're trying to help people, we're trying to translate the science, um, the wealth of knowledge into the therapy room to try and um, assist people. And it's tools like the mid 60 that synthesize um, all of that knowledge um, uh, uh, gathered over years and condense it into a tool which has clinical utility. And so thank you for producing such a useful tool for us all oh, to use. 
I'm just so pleased that it's been valuable to people because, I mean, it's really awful when people don't get diagnosed and they get much worse over time. Uh, the longer it goes on and the dissociative structures get reinforced. So when people can pick it up early and particularly, um, you know, younger people when that's picked up, then, you know, the treatment outcomes are so much faster and so much better. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for tonight. And thank you, everyone, for um, for coming. Um, do yeah, do check out the mid sixty on Novo Psychs, and, and and what I tend to do is I tend to administer it to myself or any questionnaire that I'm going to use in Novo Psych. I tend to self administer it, well, to see how 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 many problems I have, but also to familiarise myself with the scale so that I can talk with the client about it, um, having experienced it myself and um, knowing all the questions, and it, and it can also be an interesting um, way of uh, self reflecting and see, seeing where at where, where we are at on the dissociative um, scale. Well, the normal people are about 13%. So most people do associate, you know, 13% of the bit. time. Oh, it's still quite, it's still quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks.